Greg, uh, pure mathematicians generally believe that they are discovering, not inventing in that there is a set of mathematical truths that are uh, in platonic heaven, as it were, uh, that they are finding out about as they go down. You, you have a different approach to uh, uh, what makes mathematics true. Yeah, um, I don't see mathematics as that different. I don't see mathematics as that different from physics. Um, in mathematics, the laboratory is the computer rather than a physics lab, but what you're doing in both physics and math is compressing a lot of uh, observations, in one case physical observations, in the other case mathematical observations, into a more concise theory. So you're unifying, you're seeing common patterns. Mm -hmm. And I think in both cases, I, I use a phrase of Lakatosh, which is, I like to put it, that mathematics is quasi-empirical. Uh, the way I used to say it before reading Lakatosh is, I would say pure mathematics is not theoretical physics, right? It's not a branch of physics, but it's not as different as most mathematicians think. Mm, mm. So let me say why. I think this is ultimately a consequence of Gödel, but I think it's clearer with the information theoretic complexity approach uh, that I have, which talks about the halting probability omega, for example, about bits of algorithmic information, the complexity of a theory versus the complexity of the mathematical phenomenon that the theory is trying to capture. So with my point of view, the platonic world of mathematical ideas has infinite complexity in terms of bits of algorithmic information, whereas any mathematical theory of the kind that Hilbert liked, a formal axiomatic theory, only has a finite, in fact, a rather small sure. number of bits of information. So in a sense, your mathematical truth is, your theory is only an infinitesimal part, captures only an infinitesimal part of the whole truth. And omega is a tangible example of this because it's a number whose numerical value actually is bit, per, bit by bit the, an infinite amount of um, complexity or of information about the platonic world of mathematics and cannot so be compressed. How is that so? How, how, how is the omega a, an expression of the infinite world of mathematics? Because each bit is one more bit of irreducible mathematical information. About the halting? Problem? Yes, yes. Be and an infinite why? number of bits. Wh 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 why do you need an infinite number of bits to, to describe the halting problem well, for a computer, whether or not it Well, holds. the numerical value turns out to be irreducible mathematical information. That means it looks random, mm -hmm, is the mm -hmm, word. Mm -hmm. It looks random, but it's actually very meaningful, useful information. If we could mm -hmm. know the bits of the halting probability, omega, it would settle things like the Riemann hypothesis if you knew enough bits. Right. Because the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to For a halting numbers, problem. Yeah. yeah, things like that. So uh, I, w I was asking, um, let me say it again, the, uh, why is omega in the halting problem an, an example of, of uh, pure mathematics? Okay, I see omega and this whole information theoretic approach to measure how much information there is in the observations mm -hmm. or in the mathematical facts and measure how much information there is in the principles that you're using to attempt to explain them, mm -hmm. I think this approach makes mathematics look more like physics. Mm -hmm. Because in both cases, it's compression, it's unification, mm -hmm. is the reason you believe the principles. And if this approach is true, it suggests to me that um, pure mathematics should be willing to add new principles, not because they're self-evident, and they're certainly not consequences of your existing principles, because then it would be a theorem, not a, right. a new axiom. Be derived from rather than right. existing in the But for pragmatic reasons, because it helps to explain a lot of mathematical phenomena. Or, as Gödel says in one of his remarks, because Gödel, I can also read Gödel as being a quasi, mm -hmm. backing the quasi empirical point of view, um, says one of remarks, if you simplify existing proofs, with a new principle, that also tends to justify this new principle pragmatically. Mm -hmm. Also, if you can prove things you couldn't prove before that you were trying to prove, that tends to justify a new principle, even though it's not self-evident. Now, um, so in other words, I think that mathematics is open and creative and in statu nascendi. It's not static, perfect, and mm -hmm. um, immutable. So in, so in one sense, what you're doing 
if I'm a pure mathematician, is degrading math. Uh, stay with me for a second because you're degrading it because it doesn't have this ultimate purity. Absolute certainty. Absolute certainty, the quasi-empirical nature. And you're using a computer to find pure math, you know, seems uh, a kind of a significant uh, undermining of the, the nature of math. On the other hand, what you're saying is the opposite, that that gives you more freedom to develop math. Is that right? Yeah, I'm saying, you know, if Hilbert had been right, pure math would be a, a sort of a cemetery. A, a formal axiomatic theory is the cemetery hmm. for a field of knowledge. Hmm. Um, it's when it's all over and you codify it there. Um, I think it's much more interesting if something is creative and open. I think it's much more fun. It gives our descendants more to do. Um, now, That's certainly uh, true in general, but is it true in math? Yeah, look, I think I can prove it, but maybe it's better to give an example, right? And there's a good example, which is uh, mathematical cryptography, which is very important for practical applications, right? To, for banks, for example, doing business on the computer, you want to encrypt. Now, it would be nice if you could prove that the encryptions can't be broken. But uh, in fact, no one has succeeded in coming up with an encryption scheme that is provably, that they can prove it can't be broken. So they behave in a quasi-empirical way. There are unproved principles that the cryptographic community agrees on. And, and based on this, you can prove that a crypto system is good. Hmm. But occasionally it turns out that people crack a system, and then the community has to, has to regroup, the same as happens in, in physics.